came up here today to find some cows. It happens to be very windy and rainy and foggy, but through the mists, there they are. So why would I bother to put myself up here for some cows? Well, it has a lot to do with the text that we're looking at today in the book of Amos. As we've been tracing through this prophecy of Amos, uh, we've gotten quite a vivid picture of Jeroboam II's Israel. At this time, the kingdom of Israel embraced injustice. There was slavery of the poor. There was economic oppression. And overall, there was marginalization of the vulnerable. We understand the covenant context of the nation of Israel, that God gave this nation a way of life in the Sinaitic Covenant in which the vulnerable were taken care of. Here in Jeroboam II's Israel, the vulnerable are being taken advantage of. And so necessarily, it provokes a prophetic encounter. God invites Amos up to the northern kingdom to denounce its ways in hopes that they may turn and be restored to God and find themselves living in the kind of society he envisions for them, one that represents his kingdom interest to the world. How would Amos get the attention? of this recalcitrant nation. What rhetoric could stir them out of their spiritual stupor? Well, Amos does something we all want to do sometimes. He starts name calling. Our boy Amos is about to get salty, real salty. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, and say to your husband, bring us some drinks. Is it okay for us to name call? Is that what this is telling us? Well, before we answer that question, let's explore a little bit of this idea that prophets come to rebuke and even call people names. Well, Jesus got a little saucy when he told a group of Pharisees, you brood of vipers. Now that is an insult. You can pause here to check out the passage. Jesus got real sassy when he told some religious elite that they were whitewashed tombs. There's a word we're gonna read in a coming chapter of this prophecy in chapter five. And uh, there's a syntactical connection here. There's a tone shift. But this word is words that prophets use on occasion. And sometimes in particular, they use it to get people's attention right before they insult them. Dr. Eric Mason has some insights about this word. This, but woe to you Pharisees. Whoa. Now, now the woe now to you, you be, uh, be very, very scared if God says woe to you. Woe isn't slowing a horse down in the Bible. Woe in the Bible is a judgment oracle, a pending judgment that can come upon you because of something systemically wrong with you and the group of people. Usually it's said to group of people, not merely individuals, but, 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 but systemic structures that placate and play into the way things are perceived in a particular society. I, I believe that there's some governments and some places in our world that God's going to be saying woe to, and that God is saying woe to it. The leaders of Israel, Jesus says woe to them. He says woe to them because they were supposed to be the guides of the nation. So Jesus uses this word to introduce a warning. Jesus needs to get the attention of the people he's speaking to. So is this just Jesus and Amos get to do this? And... and if you think you're rude, you should check out Jude. He released a string of insults. I'm too bashful to repeat. You ain't heard nothing yet if you ain't heard Zeke's woes. This guy gets downright strange. This guy has some super vivid and super inappropriate insults to his audience. There's, there's actually 
quite a tradition of insults within scripture. So guys, these insults have some things in common that we can look at and kind of filter ourselves through. These words of woe are addressed to people of power, either religious power or political power. And these harsh words are designed to get the attention for people for the sake of repentance. So guys, biting and sharp rhetoric, these words to help jar our sensibilities into paying attention to what God is doing. They're meant to be corrective. I personally don't think God wants us to chuck around insults just for the sake of degrading people. But here, we see God using harsh language to jar the people into paying attention to where they stand with God. So, cows of Bashan? He's calling these wealthy women in Samaria cows of Bashan. Remember, Bashan was this region where cattle were famed. These women in Samaria that Amos is making fun of, he's indicting them because they are not paying attention to the oppression and the plight of the poor in their cities while they decadently recline and indulge themselves. Does this economic divide at all sound familiar? So. While these women are focused on serving themselves, the poor and the vulnerable remain unserved. God reports that they will be a part of a military defeat. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will each go straight out through the breaches in the wall, and you will be cast out toward Harmon, declares the Lord. And indeed, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to Assyria in generations to come. We are to see the defeat and the humiliation of this nation as the fulfillment of its departure from God. So, could you speak to people of power like this? Well, let's take a look at the unique role that prophets played in the nation of Israel. Prophets, as presented in these prophetic writings, address people in crisis, whether those people know it or not. Prophetic speeches and personas confront ancient communities and powers with God's message. These confrontations use rhetoric that explicitly or implicitly challenges the hearers and readers of these texts to change their behavior. So Amos then begins to mock the religious culture of Northern Kingdom Israel. It's not just that this society ignores the poor. It does so assuming that it's in right relationship with God. And so Amos invites them to worship. And he does so with a sarcastic irony. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do, declares the Sovereign Lord. Go to church, guys. Lift your hands, sing. Go to the places where your idols are present. That's the thing, guys. You see, there was this foundational sin in the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam I's idol-making. It was laid into the groundwork, the foundation of this kingdom. And if you read through the book of Kings, it never gets fully addressed. Generation after generation after generation fail to call out and repent of an idolatry upon which their country was built. Jeroboam I selected two cultic locations for his idol worship. One was at Dan. This is a replica of the four-horned altar upon which idolatrous sacrifice would have taken place. The other main location was at Bethel, and as Amos mentions, a nearby location of Gilgal had also become a favorite of idol worship gatherings. And they hear the prophetic voice over and over and over again, and yet they fail to return. 
return to Yahweh, God of Israel, in the way that Yahweh, God of Israel, wants to be worshipped. Not through the worship of a, an unsanctioned golden calf. The justice issues within Northern Kingdom Israel are actually symptomatic of a foundational sin that Amos here marks. You see, at Bethel, there was this golden calf. Let's read about Bethel and Dan and how what happened there so long ago was left ignored generation after generation. It's foundational idol. It's foundational sin that shaped and distorted Northern Kingdom Israel away from the kind of place and people it could have been. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too far to you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. This foundational sin remained in Israel 12 kings later. A political inconvenience became a national intergenerational sin. When undealt with sin shapes a country generation after generation after generation, it may be that that sin is so much a part of the fabric of that society that they're less able to see it. We have to talk about our foundational sins. We have to address them. Yes, it may sting a little bit to be called a cow of Bashan, but if it gets your attention, if it jars you, God, where am I in my relationship with you? Does my life look the way you want it to look? Am I representing your interests? Am I housing any idols in my life, in my culture, in my society? God, help me to see the posture against the prophetic rebuke, the prophetic mockery should be one of openness towards God. God, I hear you. I am burdened by what you're saying about me and I want to come to you in humility. And Amos actually gives us another tool that we're gonna talk about in coming sessions, something called lament. I'm tempted my best to exegete to understand what's happening in the original audience. If you'll permit me a little bit to, to try to chew on this as American Christians. We move from exegesis, understanding the cultural context of the original audience, to trying to see this and apply it to our own life. Do we have foundational sin in our country? I would argue that we do. And among them is the horrible tragedy complicity of the church and our nation and our society and our culture and the sin of racial slavery. Jamar Tisby writes, historically speaking, when faced with the choice between racism and equality, the American church has tended to practice a complicit Christianity rather than a courageous Christianity. They chose comfort over constructive conflict and in doing so, created and maintained the status quo of injustice. So guys, I don't want to be like Jeroboam the Second's Israel. I don't want to be unable to talk about the things in our nation's history that haven't fully been dealt with. Sins that continue to shape not only the legacy of our country, but the legacy of the church. I don't want to be unable to talk about it. I don't want to be in the generation that ignored the idol. I don't want to be in the generation that ignored the foundational sin. I'm not content being a cow of Bashan, reclining in my indulgence while injustices abound.
we move forward with Amos's ministry, he's going to return to the topic of religious celebration and church life. He's going to give us a new diagnostic on whether or not our worship is honoring God. It's not just the songs or the, the meaningfulness of your heart, but it's bigger than that. It's broader than that. And it affects the poor, the vulnerable, the oppressed, and the way that we carry ourselves in society. So whether or not God gives us the license to, to use insults, to shape and to jar people into assessing their relationship with God, let us first hear it for ourselves. How are you doing with this? Is your experience more like the women of Samaria who have insulated themselves from the cries of the oppressed? Or are we, like Amos, finding ourselves frustrated by a society that takes advantage of, that ignores the plight of the poor? Or are we, like Amos, driven to a holy frustration by the injustices we see in our country? And all of this, all of this rhetoric, no matter how harsh, is designed to get us to ask the question and to seek God. God, where am I in my relationship with you? Where are we, society, in our relationship with you? May we humble ourselves and approach you without pride, without pretense. And there, as we'll go along in Amos' prophetic ministry, we find hope of restoration. And we'll talk about more next time the way that we correct this prideful attitude.